I don't care if people say, well, the men were inspired. The words are inspired. I don't care which one's inspired. God sent His Word from heaven to earth. Now, He did that Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic text. He didn't do it in English. would be easier if He had. We do believe that we have an accurate, preserved, in the English language, Word of God. We don't have a problem with that. And I don't want to do that. But, but it has become fashionable among evangelicals and fundamentalists to say, I believe in the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. I believe God has preserved His Word and mean His message, not the words. And that gives you a lot of wiggle room to change things. Back at World War I, just before World War I, post-millennialism saw the missions movement spreading across the world. Liberalism was sure that the, that the Christian ethic would sweep the world and it would all become a better place. And then World War I came along, and not long after World War I, World War II. And any hope that an, a utopia would suddenly erupt out of humanity died. Well, what do you do with liberal theology? Carl Barth said, here's an easy thing to do. We'll just go back and use the old-fashioned Bible terminology, but we'll put new meanings in it. Modern, modern Bible colleges and modern preachers, young preachers, are coming out using the same words that we use, but meaning something completely different. What is the message that God has preserved? Is it the message that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? Is it one, two, three, pray with me and everything will be all right? Uh, what is the message, God? We should follow in the way of Jesus. The message is subjunctive. I read the, or subjective. I read the Bible. I interpret. I decide, oh, this is the message God wants. I may get it wrong. A translator might get it wrong. It's not my job to tell you what God meant if I'm a translator. It's my job to tell you what He said. And we've lost that. We've lost that. Neo-Orthodox Christians talk about salvation, redemption, justification. All those things mean something completely different. And modern preachers in Bible colleges talk about Preserving the Word of God and means something completely different. Let me give you several scripture verses. I'm trying to watch the time too. This is not working because I had already burned up ten minutes with one page. Jeremiah one nine. The Lord put forth His hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I put my words in your mouth, in thy mouth. Sixty times Ezekiel said that his writings are the words of God. Uh, Daniel said, Yet heard I the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, uh, not only them, but I have some guys you and I may not agree with with everything. But the doctrine of the inspiration of the Scripture is not new. Clement, the pastor of the church at Rome, wrote uh, that the Scriptures are the true utterances of the Holy Ghost. Irenaeus, another early church father, Matthew may have been written, uh, Matthew might have written, the generation of Jesus was on this wise, but the Holy Spirit, foreseeing the corruption of the truth and fortifying us against deception, says, through Matthew, the generations of Jesus the Messiah was on this wise. Now I'm quoting, or I didn't use the King James Bible. Clement of Alexandria, who was Origen's teacher, and we all love Origen so much, uh, the foundations of our faith rest on no insecure basis. We have received them through God Himself, through the Scriptures, not one jot or tittle of which shall pass away till all is fulfilled. Of those holy writings or words the Bible is composed, the sacred writings consist of these holy letters or syllables since they are God breathed. That's, that's Origen's teacher. I skipped him because I don't like him. 
Augustine, along with Tertullian, Cyprian, the fathers of the North African church. The scriptures are the letters of God, the voice of God, the writings of God. The writers record the words of God. It's nothing new. It has been held from the very beginning of Christianity that the Bible is the words of God, the indestructible, preserved words of God. Yet in the 21st century, we have figured out uh, that God didn't mean what He said. We have to explain it to people along the way. I'm going to skip over to page 3 for, for brevity. But when I was at, in my first Bible college, they're defunct now, uh, Dr. David Smith was sitting in his car outside the classroom. We were talking to him and, and said to Dr. Smith, Don't you believe that the Bible was verbally, plenarily inspired? Oh, yes, I believe that's the way it was at the beginning. But we are so far from the beginning, what does it matter? They promptly threw me out of school. God promised to protect His Word and His words, then only a translation of the Bible which preserves those words into another language truly represents His message to men. I took a, a passage out of the, the handbook of the United Bible Society that tells people like Wycliffe translators and whatnot how to translate the Bible. Translating Leviticus 23, 25-27, uh, laborious work, an offering of fire, or a food offering, uh, the Day of Atonement. This important celebration is also described in chapter 16 as well as Numbers 29. It may hang with also, or yeah, it may hang with also, bear the title, the day, great day of the forgiveness of sins. No, it's not the great day of the forgiveness of sins. It is the Day of Atonement. Kippora, the day of the covering of my sins. The forgiveness of sins waited till Jesus had died on the cross and washed them away. The sins of the Old Testament were only covered till He could get to the cross. That's what atonement means, covering. When, mo when, when they took pitch and pitched the ark, that's the same word, Kippora. They covered the ark with pitch. Uh, the, uh, they, didn't, they didn't take the ark away, they covered the ark. When you change atonement to the day of forgiveness of sins, you take away what God said there and ruin some things along the way. I'm not going to stay with that long. I'm not a, I don't use the handbook. It's not worth the paper it's written on. On page whatever I'm on for, uh, B. Second, this is, there's not a commitment in scholarship that would give us a group of qualified translators for this project. This man behind me probably knows the Greek and Hebrew text better than anybody I know. And I don't think, Dr. Waite, you would presume to retranslate the Bible, would you? No. Neither would I. The men who translated your King James Bible had literally thousands of years of experience in the various Bible languages. They didn't have TV. They didn't have radios, newspapers. These guys read Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and Chaldee and all those other languages day and night. When Cotton Mather graduated from Harvard College back in the in, in Pilgrim days, his final exam was there was a, a board of clerics across the front. They would read any passage from the Bible in Greek or Hebrew. He had to give a running translation back in Latin without any notes. I don't know anybody alive today who can do that. The men who translated our King James Bible had such a de de uh, uh, focused understanding of those Bible languages, reading the Masoretic notes around the outside of the text. A couple of years ago, I did a, a study in, in the society here on the Hebrew text. They haven't changed the Masoretic text itself. It's those notes around the outside that tells you, well, stick this in there, don't you? They wouldn't dare to touch it. They don't believe in touching it, even if it's obviously wrong. They put it in the notes. Those guys knew the notes. They knew rabbis. They knew things you and I don't even begin to know. You couldn't find people to do it. But then down in the middle of the page, there's an important corollary, and this is the one that really, I think, has a problem, is that the public no longer wants an accurate Bible. 
What do they tell you when they, you tell them you use the King James Bible? Well, I love the King James Bible, but this one's easier to understand. I love the King James Bible, but this one has smoother language. I love the King James Bible, but I love it, but. Uh, that'd be like you go home and tell your wife, I love you, but. I like Mary over here, too. And she's better. And, and of course, our society is doing that one as well. But, but in order to do a translation, you have to have people that want to read it. And we keep trying to make the Bible attractive to unsaved people. Guess what? The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. There's only one thing an unsaved person can, can understand in the Bible, and that is you must be born again. And if they don't like that, not going to get saved. Not going to get saved. They don't get saved. They don't get Holy Spirit discernment. They're not going to understand the Bible. You could translate it on a first grade level. They still wouldn't understand it because the problem's not intellectual. The problem is spiritual. But they want to make money. Let me go on. I'm trying to skip through so I don't get overly long. This is unusual for me. Start at the top of page 5. Anyone familiar with a thesaurus knows that any given word can and usually has multiple synonyms. It's the job of a translator to know the nuances of the Greek and Hebrew synonyms as he chooses the correct English synonym. Some incompetent translators, I argued with a fellow from Springfield, uh, the Baptist Bible Theological Seminary out there. He's no longer a professor there. But I argued with him about a translation, and he said, any time you have any legitimate English word in the thesaurus, you can match it with any Greek word, in, and it's an accurate translation. That's not true. That's just not true. And uh, how many of you are old enough to remember the, movie, the, the book Fail Safe? That was all of us who lived through the, the nuclear winter of the 50s when they were going to come down on us. Safe is a story about, uh, it was to strike fear about nuclear war. And, and supposedly John Kennedy's president of the United States and, and a, a B-52 uh, bombers all loaded with, with nukes are heading for Russia. It's on a, an exercise. And they call them back, but one transistor's gone out of a computer, and, and one fluid flight of B-52s is heading for Russia, and it cannot be stopped. And the president, uh, he gets him a, a translator, and uh, uh, he makes a statement in the book, and it's on the top of page 6. Most situations I can handle myself, the president went on, but I don't speak Russian. You do. You might have to translate for me, and the translation has to not only be literal, be not only literally perfect, but it should catch every emphasis that I intend and the tones I use to convey meaning. Have you ever sent an email and the person receiving it got all mad and you couldn't understand why? Or, I know emails passe, Facebook, instant, Instagram, it, chat, all that stuff. I don't do any of it. My phone just makes telephone calls. But, do you ever do that? Somebody got mad and you, you couldn't understand. Because words don't normally carry the same emotion as somebody speaking. And so God carefully chose words that could not be misunderstood, no matter what language they're translated into, so that He would carry the word, the meaning, the intentions of every phrase in the Scripture. People don't want that. They want to grab a Bible, oh, this one speaks to me. You ever get that line? This one speaks to me. Yeah, well... A lot of people speak to me, but not everybody has good things to say to me. We do not have the luxury of just choosing any English word to represent a Greek or Hebrew word. The word, that's that place you told me to change it, Brother Wait, I missed that one. He proofread me. The word is not mere human speculation. God was very specific in his word. Translator of the Scriptures must be born again. I quote the passage from 1 Corinthians 2 uh, going down through there. Uh, Dr. Rice, 
years ago compared that to the the fiery the the bush that would not burn up with Moses. He said, "You got to have the bush, but you have to have the fire too. You have the human authors, the bush, but you you have the divine author. If that didn't burn, if the if the translation does not burn with the presence of God, it's just another book." You say, but it's a Bible. Yeah, but it's not. Translation of the Bible is not mechanical rendering of one word in one language for a word. I'm on page 8. Every liter- great literary work is nuanced. Words mean things. Synonym- synonyms are important. Phrasing is important. Word position is important. When you read your Bible, Christ Jesus doesn't mean the same thing as Jesus Christ. You say, well, it's the same person. Yes, it is. But when you say Christ Jesus, you are emphasizing His offices and His work. He is the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the one who died for your sins. He's the great high priest. He's the King of heaven itself. When you say Jesus Christ, you're emphasizing His humanity. You say, well, what's the big deal? A little bit. No, a lot of bit. God meant to emphasize what He meant to emphasize. What's one word? The day of the Lord. Day of Christ in 2 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. If you translate that and change that to the day of the Lord, you have to be post-trib rapture. You don't have a choice. It makes that verse inconsistent with all the other scriptures that talk about the pre-trib return of Christ. Because that one says the day of the Lord can't come until the wicked one be revealed, the Antichrist, and the great falling away. Schofield tried to make the great apostasy, and the Greek word is apostasia. You can't play with it. He said, well, that's a catching away. That's the rapture. No, it's not. The day of Christ is the day Christ comes to reign and rule for a thousand years. It's the day of His reward for being a faithful servant. And it doesn't begin until after the tribulation when the Antichrist is revealed and the great apostasy takes place. You change one word, you change the whole meaning. Wasn't Christ the Lord? Yes, He is. But God was saying a very specific thing. This thing is ringing if somebody can fix it. Christ was saying a very specific thing. When he said what he said in Second Thessalonians chapter two, I know uh, English was in a very was in a unique point in its development as a language. It no longer has the same ability to express with precision things necessary for a Bible comparable to the King James Bible. A little bit of history, and I won't stay on the history long. But the 13th and 14th centuries were some of the most important centuries in history. During the 13th century, England got into a war with France called the Hundred Years' War. Up until that point, England was a province of Normandy, and Normandy, France, was a province of England. And, And William the Conqueror had a backdoor connection to the airship to the throne in Paris. And for a hundred years, the English were trying to assert their right to rule over France. William the Conqueror, 1066, made French the official language of the British court. English was considered such a backwoods plowman language, it wasn't fit to be able to carry literature. All of the work of the churches and the schools was done in in Latin, and all of the work of, of the government was done in French, and the plowmen, they pushed a little bit of English around, which was more German than it was English. That was Middle English. England lost the Hundred Years' War in the beginning of the 1400s. It was the greatest victory the English ever had. When they lost the war, the English Channel separated England from the the continent, and England began to develop a culture all of its own. Her, Her French got so degraded that the French couldn't understand the English Frenchmen, kind of like Haitian French against Parisian French. And so the government began to speak more and more in English. 
The, the clerics in the churches no longer went to Rome. And now they started to speak English in the churches. The universities began to speak English in the universities, but there were dialects all over England that were different and strange. Meanwhile, over on the continent, the French had taken the Pope captive over to Avignon, France. And the French had a captive pope. After 70 years, the Austrians came down and they saw Rome and said, man, what a tourist trap. Rome was about 35,000 people at the time. It had decreased from 3 million under the Roman Empire. The Austrians came down and they put in a new pope. Now you had two popes. That's pretty tough when you have two guys speak in the ex-cathedra. They're both in full authority. The French, of course, followed their pope. The English followed the Roman pope because they didn't like the French. So now Europe breaks into crusades as they're fighting for their various popes. And soldiers are dying. The crusades are hit. The black plague hits. And suddenly there aren't any knights left. And feudalism died in England. You no longer were a part of serf on a, on, a, on a big plantation. There were more and more middle class people. They were starting to use money. And for two centuries, the British middle class developed. And they spoke English. 1450s, Gutenberg invents the movable press, printing press. Over here, 1380, Wycliffe translates the Bible. 1456, I believe it is, Byzantium falls, and suddenly Europe is awash with Greek and Hebrew manuscripts of the Bible. The British people want a Bible that is accurate to the Greek and Hebrew. Wycliffe had worked with the Latin version, but the British people, they want an English Bible that is true to the Hebrew and Greek. Luther's done his Bible. We want a Bible like Luther's. And Tyndale comes on the scene. And then that series of trans- Translators come on the scene, and England is getting closer and closer to an English Bible that finds universal acceptation. 1611, King James comes on the scene, and he authorizes the King James Bible as we know it. Those men picked one dialect of English, and that dialect of English didn't do the job, so they would reach over to German and borrow a word. They would reach to France and borrow a word. They'd reach to Spain and borrow a word. And they invented the precedent in the English language of just pulling words from any language. So we talk perestroika as if it's an English word. We talk jail comes from the Spanish jail. And and we have borrowed words from all over the place. And we don't think any... The French have... they, They have a cabinet level office that keeps French pure. You can't have a little McDonald's. You have to have it with a French word. But English, we can suck. And that's why English became the language of the world. But by having the Bible in one dialect, all Englishmen learn to speak that dialect. Just like in America, regional accents are dying. Up in New England, they're starting to say ours. Down in the south, you're starting to lose the y'alls because television's the great equalizer. In 1611, this book was the great equalizer. I'm going to Australia because I'm in a debtor's prison. What I take with me? Take my Bible. I'm going to go to Georgia because I'm in a debtor's prison. What I'm going to take? My Bible. I'm going to gravitate or go to migrate to the United States. I'm going to go to India. I'm going to go to Canada. What do I take? I can't take everything. They didn't have big suitcases. You have one, one chest. Take your whole family stuff. You took your Bible. When you got to India, you taught your children to read out of the Bible. And this book that I hold in my hand created modern English. Shakespeare is writing it about the same time. People came to see Shakespeare's plays and they read the English Bible and according to literary scholarship...
60, they bought the World Book Encyclopedia. I was telling Brother Jerry and Sharon as we were coming down. Uh, they bought the World Book Encyclopedia. That was, that was library reading, if you know what I mean. You kept it on that white shelf in that little room. And I'd go in there and I'd read the whole A encyclopedia. I might read it for a week till I got through that whole that whole volume of the encyclopedia. I'd take it out, bring in B. That would be the next word read. That's where I learned things. I just read books. You know, if I, I found a word I didn't understand, I got out a dictionary and looked it up. Because it's not bringing the standard back to the men. It's bringing the men to the standard. The English that our King James Bible came from... Did, now, is that time up or is that just three, three minutes? Okay. The English that King James Bible came from was not spoken in the streets. They already had that in the Bishop's Bible. And the English-speaking people said, this Bible is accurate, but it does not reflect the majesty and power of a book that is the words of God. And there are several examples toward the end of the paper that you can look up. Uh, on page uh, 18, or no, it's not on page 18. I've lost where I'm at. Uh, uh, it's in here someplace. You can look it up. But there are several examples that you can see of some of the earlier readings of the Scripture and how the King James Bible elevated the language. And that's why I mean, people say to us, where was the Bible before the King James Bible? Did they have the Geneva? Yeah, they did. They, the King James translators say we didn't take a bad translation and replace it. We took good translations and we made it better. And when the English Bible met the expectations of the English-speaking peoples in its majesty, its its
because of my friend Barbara the Master. Rick and Mary Bonko, we attend the Bible today in church yesterday. Super. Come on. Barbara the Master, I attend Bible for today, and I heard about the Inverted Society because when I started attending Bible study and buying about a dozen books a week to understand the whole of God's heart thing, Daniel at one point put a DBS magazine in my back. It's Brian Hayes, Woodbury, New Jersey. Bible Church in Westville, and I received your mail. Super, amen. Right That's right. I mean, by the way, Richard and Cheryl Stemple, we go to Harry Travis Church in Laurel, and this is Sweet. Pastor John, some of my fellowship at the church in Chesapeake, Virginia. Uh, I'm going to say that I'm Dr. Ed Smith uh, from Chesapeake, Virginia, Tidewater Baptist uh, Church, and uh, I'm Dr. Wade for uh, 17, 18 years. Jerry B., my wife Sharon from Bellingham, Massachusetts, and I'm going to buy some of the free throws from my Grace Baptist Church. Mm. I'm currently to my pastor Grace Baptist Church in Lakeville, Massachusetts. I wrote it down so you can send it. Yes, and Kathy Dini of Gloria, Illinois, Valley Baptist Church, and we got it from May. Mm-hmm. I'm David Cooper, this is my wife, Judith, who are from Marietta, Georgia, Bible, Bible Baptist Church in Georgia. Pastor, and I heard about it last year. Amen. It's great. Dr. Wade asked me the first time I ever talked to him, are you sure? Do you want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> and I've done it two times. We've done it two times, and it's looking forward to it next year. No. Brother Randy, you're next, sir. I'm listening. Yeah, right. Right beside Amen. Yeah. All right, Bill. Bill Shepard, Bible for today. I promise to be with you. I'm in the Bible. The Bible was the material I heard of the Bible's presence. Amen. I'm in the Salem County. New Jersey. Paul?
Ma cosa può fare lui, Joel? Sometime during the next break, you can prayerfully consider um, or think of somebody, ask the Lord to bring some reminder. You may be able to want to call or text and tell them about the meeting, whether, you're, whether they can come in person or they can watch us online, or we'll by that time the sound issue will be resolved. Um, but it's, it's really nice that you're here. The theme of, of this year's conference is uh, correctly crossing uh, the textual divide. You see, there's a division in uh, modern Christendom today. And when we consider the influence of scholars, how they influence modern Bibles, uh, it's something you must consider a whole lot. How, how a scholar, how some teacher, how some professor, how some Bible translator, how they can have an influence upon what, what goes into a Bible as far as how it's going to read, what they're going to leave out. And so scholarship can have, a, in most cases, a negative influence upon uh, the Scripture. Now, it's not just an, uh, an issue of the English, this issue, as far as the textual issue. It's an issue that applies to all the languages of the world. Yes, English may be the most common language, the most spoken language in the world, or most known language in the world, but it also means it also applies to German, to French, to Portuguese, to Spanish. All these languages, and that's only naming a handful of them. There's a lot of languages out there. And so we want to, we want the, the encouragement should be that we have proper translation from the proper Greek and Hebrew text of the scripture. You see, the Dean Bergon Society, it is a single issue society. And that issue is in defense of traditional Bible texts. Now, historically, a scholar was a student. That's all that meant. Now, that, that definition has changed somewhat. I mean, in a certain sense, we still use it that way. A scholar is a student any old student, whether it's a very young student or a very older student. But that definition has changed. Now, as far as influence is concerned, what is influence? Now, Webster defines influence as the power to change or affect someone or something, the power to cause to change without directly forcing them to happen. So scholars, whether they know it or not, are Indirectly, or sometimes directly, causing something to happen. I think um, Dr. Dimitro mentioned, or if he didn't mention it, I imagine he mentioned it, or maybe I was just thinking about this. When you have a professor, a teacher in the classroom, 
when, it, when he says something to his students about perhaps a passage of Scripture where he questions whether it should be in the Bible or not, okay, that teacher could articulate that in the academic sense, but yet the student is going to go home and he'll t- he, he will likely take it a step further. If the teacher will say, I'm not really sure if this should be in the Bible, you know, it's not in my Greek New Testament, then the student is going to take that a step further and he may completely disregard it. At some, sometimes, even study Bibles uh, will question the Word of God. Even study Bibles that are based upon good, as far as the, the, the translation of the study Bible, is based upon a good and faithful, reliable Greek text. The key ones will be to Mark 16, 9 to 20, and so forth, other passages. And there are people that will look at that footnote from a reputable study Bible. And I'm talking about in a, the notes are put into, into, into a King James Bible, no doubt. But they'll look at those notes, and those notes, which is just a mere suggestion by the compiler of the study Bible, the reader of that Bible may even take a pencil. If they, if they say in the, in the say footnote, it says, says the word earlier and better manuscripts do not contain these passages. And of course, what does earlier and better mean? Perhaps we'll get to that in a moment. And so some people will actually cross those verses out of their Bible because the footnote will say they don't belong in the Bible. Essentially what they're saying. They're saying earlier and better manuscripts. The inference is there that those words, those verses, do not belong in the Bible. Now, what is a modern Bible? Now, a modern Bible is any Bible translation after 1881. Now, 1881 is 135 years ago. I know people that have been born, were born in 1991, they're 35 years old this year, but 100 years old, 100 years before their birth, that's when we began to have problems with modern Bibles. Now, I understand there was only one or two, one Bible in the, in the UK and one Bible in the United States, at least in our English language, but still, that's when the modern Bibles made the scene because that's when the West Concord text, the Greek text, well, that's when the, 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 the Greek text appeared. And people started wondering whether they should use that Greek text over the text of Receptus. So you understand there are, there are two primary Greek texts, to keep it simple. we got the, 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 the stream of the West Canton Horton Gnostic text, and then we have the text of Receptus type of Greek text. And so there, there are the two different types of manuscripts. Now, as far as, as I said, the, a single issue of society, we stand for in defense of the traditional Bible text. Now, what does defense mean? Well, again, Webster, we don't need Webster to tell us the definition, but I'll read the definition anyway. The act of defending someone or something from attack. Now, what is under attack today? What's under attack is the traditional Bible texts. And the society, we stand in defense of traditional Bible texts. We want to say... Hold on, Mr. Professor. Hold on, Mr. Teacher. Hold on, Mr. Study Bible Editor. What you're saying is not quite accurate. There is another side of the issue, another side of the story. And so that's what we are here for, to defend the traditional Bible texts. The Hebrew, the Aramaic, the Greek texts that are free from Gnostic influence. It's free from Gnostic influence. Today we have fat-free, gluten-free, you know, all these different type of free things we have as far as in the foods. The, the food is absent of things. Lactose-free, or like, however, however the dietary things go. It's good for food. But it's also good if you're going to have a Greek text that should be Gnostic-free. It should be free of Gnosticism. It should be free of the influence of Gnosticism. And that's what we have when we look at the West Cotton Hort Greek text, the influence going way back before the days of West Cotton Hort, we have that problem. 
The idea of the Gnostics thinking that matter is evil. But to think of, of denying the deed of Jesus Christ. Gnostics lean towards naturalistic thinking versus supernatural thinking. Naturalism versus supernaturalism. That's who the Gnostics are. So you see, the defense of the traditional Bible texts are very important. Today, a scholar is classified differently. No longer, in the historical sense, is a scholar just a student. Today, the scholar considers himself far above and far superior to the student. In his mindset, that is, in the mindset of the scholar, he is always correct. He's always, he can never be wrong. So there's, there's footnote editors, there's, there's people that put those footnotes in, there's teachers that stand in front of their classes that say, older and better. Now, there are, there are some of them that will change. Some of them can be convinced to be changed. We have to win them over and convince them. The modern-day textual scholar quite often desires to change an opinion about the text of Scripture by the use of his reasoning and rhetoric. Again, he'll say, this reading is not in the best manuscript. And again, that's his opinion, what the best manuscript is. Students whose opinions have been changed by scholars take ideas to a different step. And consequently, any students that those students may have, their students will take it even further. So it could lead to shipwreck. Just by one professor, one teacher, questioning the words of God, it could lead to disaster. And frankly, it has led to disaster. Well, West Conhort, when they introduced their text, and they began translating that text into the English language, and in some cases into other languages, the result is a weaker text, which is a disaster. The basis for most modern Bibles, 135 years ago, to the present, is the corrupt Gnostic text of West Kind Hort, the product of scholars who wanted to bring about change in the realm of bibliology. Earlier today we were discussing bibliologies briefly. Bibliology. Bibliology is one of the ten major doctrines of Scripture. So the Scripture, as, as, as many of you know, have, is a book of, is filled with doctrine. Doctrine, you know, all scripture is given by inspiration of God for, for doctrine. Um, thank you. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is a prophet for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. See, doctrine. How important is doctrine? Doctrine is very important. Inside, under the realm of bibliology, we talk about inspiration, inerrancy, preservation, and many other subcategories of bibliology. The faith we have in the Lord Jesus Christ is based upon the words of God. Without it, Without it, we are hopeless. The doctrine of the resurrection is based on the truth of Scripture. That's one doctrine, the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 to 19, verse 19 says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. You take away Christ, you, take, you start picking away doctrines from the Bible, then you're left with nothing. You are left with, you left, you are left with a natural book. Now, a contemporary of West Cotton Hort, who were these early day 
Gnostic scholars who Westcott himself denied the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so where is that going to take him? Where is that going to take his students if he denies the bodily resurrection of Christ? And there are other doctrines that you can look at and evaluate that they were wrong on. But a contemporary of West Canton Hort was Dean Burgon. Dean Burgon. Who the society is named after. This is the Dean Burgon Society. Dean Burgon defended traditional Bible texts of Scripture. Both West Canton Hort were fans of Charles Darwin. So again, that's questioning the authenticity of the book of Genesis. I suspect they question anything in the Bible. The society stands with Dean Burgon, who stood up against West Cotton Hort and the corrupted Gnostic texts. There are two streams of texts. One originated in Antioch, and the other in Alexandrian. So again, as I said before, we had we have the West Cantor type of text, and we have the traditional text. These two different streams of texts. I mean, they may be, they may be identified slightly differently in, in places, but there there's the origin. One that came from the Alexandria, Egypt; other from the Antiochian Antiochian area. These two streams of text. Interesting, the Bible has more manuscripts in existence than any other writing. It may not be complete manuscripts, but there could be partial manuscripts. It could be small, little small, small manuscripts about this big, or it could be complete documents. But nonetheless, there's a little bit under 6,000 of the original language manuscripts. And then when you take into account the translations of those manuscripts, you know, that, that number could be, could be doubled or tripled. But there, there are... There's a lot of source out there of the, the proof that the Bible's been around for a long time. As we, as we know, it has been. It has been long, around for a, a long time. And so, we must understand, and this is what many people that we know do not understand, the Bible is not the words of man, but the Bible is the words of God. That's where the issue is many times. People do not want to accept the fact that the Bible is God's words. Now, we must distinguish between higher criticism and lower criticism. Now, this is sometimes complicated, but, but at times, sometimes these two, these two groups of people are kind of getting close to each other. But the idea of higher criticism uh, would be, for instance, with Moses. They would question the Mosaic authorship of the book of Genesis. I'm sure West Canton Hort, they question the Mosaic authorship of the book of Genesis if they were fans of Charles Darwin. And so here we have an instance when they were both trying to act as a lower critic, but yet in reality they were a higher critic. See, a higher critic is one who questions whether or not this is a supernatural book. The higher critic is going to say this, is, this Bible is a, is, is a, is a work of mankind. There was nothing to do, nothing that man, there was nothing that God had to do with, that, with it at all. That's the higher critic. The higher critic questions whether or not the historical Daniel wrote the book of Daniel when he wrote the book of Daniel. The higher critic would say all the prophecy of Scripture was written after the fact, not before. Then it's not prophecy. That's the higher critic. They're questioning the supernatural. The higher critic would say there wasn't one Isaiah, 
But there was two, maybe in some cases, three Isaiahs. Now, in a, in a classical sense, in a, in, a, in a classical sense, we have lore criticism. Now, I'm saying classical in the sense because I believe lore criticism is changing in its approach. Lore criticism, at one point in time, used to say which of the texts available to us is closest to the original. At one point in time, many of the people that were lore critics, again, a lore critic in a, in a historical sense is one who wants to determine which text of Scripture is the closest to original. To keep it simple, we'll just stick with the West Con- Horton Gnostic text and the traditional texts of Scripture. And the lower critic is trying to evaluate and say, which one is the closest to the original? This one over here, or is it this one over here? And so in a purely historical and classical sense, that's what the lower critic would do. They would try to understand which one was closest to the original. They, used, they, would, they would agree, at least historically, in the inerrancy of Scripture, in the infallibility of Scripture, in the inspiration of Scripture. But things have changed slightly and gradually. Again, it's gradual change that can get people into trouble. It's very, maybe a very small adjustment to the direction, but eventually a small direction, a small correction to your direction will end you up far away where you need to be. Sometimes, I've said this before, but I'll say it again, sometimes it seems that if the lower critics are using the same playbook as the higher critics, as far as uh, the distinction here, is there much of a difference from the words of the higher critic who says the Bible contains the Word of God versus the words of the lower critic who says God has not promised to preserve his word. In the first instance, this was a problem over 100 years ago with modernism creeping into the churches, creeping into schools. They would say, the Bible contains the word of God. Well, in other words, there's only a part of the Bible, the word of God in this Bible. It just contains it. It contains some of the word of God. That's what, that's what the Lord, higher critics of the years gone by had said. Now, fast forward to our time, where the men who are positioning themselves as lower critics, when they said that God has not promised to preserve his word, which would, which would seem to imply that just part of the Bible is preserved. Now, maybe I'm misunderstanding their statement, but that's what they're saying. God did not promise to preserve his word, which means... Does that mean that they believe that he didn't? Now, when we think about our English translation, we have, it, it's been around for one, for 400 years, over 400 years. And it's triumphed over so many other English Bibles. When we think of our, our lifetime, in our lifetime, um, uh, that's when most of these Bibles have come, come, come into play. I mean, great, great, we have different lifetimes to understand that, but let's just say in the last 50 years, a lot of these modern Bibles have, have, by the hundreds, by the hundreds they've come on the scene. And they're not any more reliable today. The ones that have come off the press today are not any more reliable than the ones that came off the press in previous years. There are a lot of doctrinal differences. Jack Mormon's come up with 8,000 differences. We have specifically 356 doctrinal different differences. For instance, uh, we know that Mark 16, 9 to 20 is missing from the Gnostic texts. But also, as, as in, next, in about 10 minutes from now, 1 John 5, 7, 8 is also missing from those texts. Verses that support the Trinity the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These, uh, these scholars, they separate substitute prepositions 
with other prepositions, like for instance, with and by. Now again, this is a textual, this is a textual dispute. It's not a, not a translation preference, it is a textual dispute. The good stream of manuscripts, the trust traditional text manuscripts, have the word by. I should tell you the verse. Second Corinthians 4.14. Second Corinthians 4.14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus Christ shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Now, the word near the end of the verse here, by Jesus. The, the Gnostic texts, they change that word by to with. So we have here in their, in their Bible, in the Gnostic Bible, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also in the, in the wrong Gnostic texts. It says, it will say, with Jesus, and shall present us with you. Now, now what would be wrong with saying to be raised up with Jesus? Now, this is a simple preposition. I mean, I remember, I, think I, well, I, I know I memorized at one point in time a bunch of prepositions in elementary school or high school. And so there is a difference with, between the preposition with and the preposition by. With would indicate, is that, is that three or four or five or three? With, with would indicate the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ has not risen yet. Now, remember that, that, that verse we read in earlier? You know, if Christ be not raised, then we are men are almost miserable. And so, what do they do with the with? With Jesus, we're not going to be raised up with Jesus. Jesus has already risen from the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. And see, these Gnostics are, are changing the words of God in a very small way. So we have to think through it. Now, you may not be completely convinced of all this, but you, you must... You must look at the scripture. You must do comparisons. I would be concerned. We're going to be raised up by Jesus. And so today's scholars is given a clear choice of either following the corrupt stream of texts or to follow the good stream of texts. Doctrine is very important. You know, we have on the front of our conference brochure, we have this, this picture of, the, um, of this bridge. This is the Benjamin Franklin Bridge, about five miles down the road or, or so. And that bridge takes you from New Jersey to Pennsylvania. There's a river that runs between the two states. In order to correctly cross that, that river, you must use the bridge. You have to ask yourself, you know, where is the Bible that you have in your hands taking you? I mean, that bridge was built in 1926. And in 1926, there weren't very many modern Bibles around. This is just the one in England and the one, one here in the States. There may have been a couple of the minor ones. But God, but, pardon me, but, but since that time, we've had hundreds of Bibles that are made the scene. And you must, and we must, properly distinguish between the good stream of texts and the Gnostic stream of texts and must not be led astray by the scholars who want to tell us differently. Please take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 9 and following. Let's uh, stand for the reading of God's word, please. 
Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereunto, according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from my commandments. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord. Teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgment of thy mouth. I rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies, as as I have riches. I will meditate in thy precepts, and I respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Thank you. You may be seated. Okay, got some. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Pastor Dan. He's the one responsible for getting all these things together. He's an expert on the videos and the, the streaming, all the computers and all the things. So we appreciate his excellent work. Let's turn to hymn number 428. 428. Sing a stanza. God will take care of you. Question all over the world, simply write us questions at bftbc.org. Questions at bftbc.org. Uh, Wendy Kosick said, Thank you, ladies, for good messages. For Mrs. Grumblatt was wonderful, different ones. I also have a message, a question. Uh, the question is, Should uh, why do you prefer the RVG, that's the Reina Valera Gomez Spanish Bible? over the 1622 or 1602 Purificada Spanish Bible. Uh, I was praying for the DBS meeting. Well, first of all, I wasn't aware of the Purificada Spanish Bible of 1602. I do know that 1602 is, is false. I don't know who, who got the Purificada one or the purified one. I do know Dr. Gomez, who's worked on the revised uh, uh, Reina Valera Gomez, and he's faithful to the text of Receptus and the King James Bible. So that's why we prefer it as far as that's concerned. All right, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Brian, uh, Mr. Brian Shepard uh, from Texas. He's going to be speaking on why John 5, 7, and 8 should remain in the Bible. Now, those who are listening on this side, can you see that screen all right? Oh, do everybody see a screen? Okay, that's fine. Uh, I want to be sure it could be seen. The Lord bless you, Brother Shepard, as you speak the word. Thank you. Popularly known as the Johannine comma or the comma Johannum and defined as the clause in the second part of 1 John 5, 7 and uh, the first part of 5 John, 1 John 5, 8, modern textual critics claim that this passage does not belong in the Bible. They do not believe that God has preserved his word or words through the ages and that is that it is up to educated men to find the ancient manuscripts 
determine which ones are the best, which ones are to be trusted, and to put the Bible back together again, since God is apparently not capable of doing this himself. This is the principal reason that we have so many translations available today in English. Each new version really is a paraphrase. Supposedly adds value that has been brought to the table by studied academics and world travelers. <clears throat> the Bible states in multiple passages that God's word to man will always be. However, it is apparently up to us through reading, studying, and cognitive engagement to discern the word, which word, is the true word. It also requires us to allow the Spirit of God Himself to help us to see and to understand. This requires faith in God and time in the Word and continual communication with God through our spirit to His Spirit, since God is a spirit. We need to do these things, read, study, meditate, pray, etc., because we have an enemy. That enemy, Satan, and his devils seek to influence men and to deceive us. The Bible has many warnings about avoiding being deceived. And yet you don't hear that apparently preached much in the modern church these days, except maybe in the fundamental church, churches. Um, why, why would God warn us so many times about avoiding being deceived if it wasn't important. <clears throat> These are just a few examples here. Um, this means that we should assume that Satan is trying to deceive us regarding many things, and especially with regard to the correct or best Bible text. How do we avoid being deceived? We need to put on the full armor of God. And we need to read the words of the Lord. Our Lord admonished us to read His Word and assumed that we would read it and read it over and over and over again. These are just a few supporting passages. But God told us through Isaiah that we should seek out God's Word and read it. When Jesus said, Have ye not read? He's asking a rhetorical question. This means that he presumes that his sheep are actively reading his revealed word. And even if it's not a rhetorical question, it should be still obvious to all that our Lord Jesus meant that we should get with the program and start reading the Scripture. Paul wrote, When ye read, which presumes that the believers are reading the Scriptures and will continue to read the Scriptures. We are to study His Word. The word study means to engage the mind in acquiring knowledge by reading, investigation, reflection, and cross-checking. It involves getting into a state of deep mental absorption. It is possible to read without being fully engaged, without having the mind engaged. God's Word says that we are to dig in, to seek understanding. This is what study is all about. We're to meditate upon His Word. <clears throat> this means to be cognitively engaged with the Scripture. It means to pray and to talk to God, our spirit to His Spirit, to seek understanding. Not to seek understanding from our way of thinking, but to seek understanding from God's way of thinking. It doesn't mean chasing the worldly ways of meditation, such as transcendental meditation or yoga. These are mind-numbing, false methods of meditation. If we read and we study and we meditate, we should be able to determine and judge and discern what is right and what is wrong with, with regard to God's will for us as believers. It also requires prayer, personal commune with God. The end result is truth. Truth is what we want because when we seek to know God and to understand God by reading, studying, meditating, praying, worshiping, and fellowshipping, with like-minded believers, we must know with great and absolute conviction that when we open God's revealed Word to us, that 
It is, it is His Word and not some cheap imitation. If I'm going to put my life on the line, and if I'm willing to be persecuted, if I'm willing to be die for my Savior, I better be using the right Word, don't you think? The truth-seeking believer needs the purest form of God's Word that he or she can find. So let's get into 1 John 5, 7, and 8. Here's the Greek. I don't know if you can see it or not, but <clears throat> this is the Greek for 1 John 5, 7. I could show the same thing for 1 John 5, 8. But I thought this would be sufficient to make the point here. Even if you don't know Greek, you can see by comparing the lengths of the passages or the citations of the verse that somebody has to be wrong. <clears throat> Notice that Stephanus and Schreiber versions are exactly the same letter for letter. And the Westcott Hort version text and the Modern Society of Biblical Literature text are also exactly the same letter for letter. What we want to determine today is who is wrong and who is right. Because they can't both be right. Which is true scripture and which is an imitation. Remember this, Satan is the great imitator. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15 states that for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers be transformed in as ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. We don't want to go that way. Let's look at the passage in English. Here I have various versions listed here. Um, White Wycliffe, Wycliffe got it right in the 14th century, despite the fact that he translated it from Latin and not the Greek. Even the Roman Catholic Bible, the Douay Reims, had it right in the 16th century, as they did in all the other years, just with just a few exceptions, as we shall see as we go through this. But after 1881, when the Westcott Hort New Testament Greek text swooned the world as the great imitator, many English versions removed 1 John 5, 7b and 1 John 5, 8a. I didn't list them all here, but just some of the most popular ones, like the ESV, the NIV, the uh, NASB. And note that the perversion used by the Jehovah's Witnesses is on the list, and it's based on the Westcott Hort Greek New Testament text, and it dovetails well with all the other modern imitations. This is from the King James Bible translation, and when you read this, can you tell what it means? It's not necessarily a particularly easy section to understand. But if you have the correct translation and you use the correct Greek to help you out, I believe you can begin to see what this is all about. I've got the comma, the Jehannam comma marked in blue here, and it says, In heaven the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness in earth. And this is what they want to take out because it is the most definite um, proclamation of the Trinity that exists in the Bible. So I want to briefly look at seven reasons why 1 John 5, 7b to 8a should be in the Bible. Argument number one, supporting roots. The, pas the passage is found in old extant manuscripts. That means they exist today. Uh, Cyprian citation is very, very old way before the alleged dates of the perverted text known as Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. The Old Italic is dated from the 6th or 7th centuries A.D., but they are copiers, copies from earlier manuscripts. Scholars unanimously agree that the Old Latin, also known as the Old Italic, was translated from the Greek text, the New Testament text, at least as early as 150 A.D., However, some scholars think it was even earlier than that, uh, perhaps to 137 A.D. or even earlier than that. The Latin Vulgate's parent was the Old Latin. Jerome claimed that 1 John 5, 7, B to 8a belonged in the Scriptures and that some person or persons wrongly removed it in the past. There aren't very many copies of the Vulgate that don't have the passage in question. 
the cursives are copies of copies of copies of copies of copies of old manuscripts that trace their roots to the first century. The cursives were the manuscripts that reflected the most use, hence they had to be recopied because they got worn out. Has anybody here ever worn out a Bible? I've worn out a few, and I'm not that old. Uh, <clears throat> this went on and on until the printing press came and finally ruled the day and uh, set the stage for our best translation in English that has come to pass, the King James Bible. Some of the oldest and most corrupt manuscripts have survived simply because they are corrupt and they were not used by the baptized believers of their day. But argument number one, their supporting roots, this is not the best argument for leaving 1 John 5, 7b to 8a in the Scriptures. We'll get to that. Here are a few more specific examples listed here um, of uh, 1 John 5, 7b to 8a being found in the ancient texts. There are many, many, many more. Notice especially here that I listed that in 302 A.D. the Emperor Diocletian ordered or commanded or issued an edict that all sacred books be burned. Guess what happened to a lot of the good Bibles at that point? They got burned. The passage, argument number two here, is the Greek witnesses. The passage is found in many extant Greek manuscripts. Old, ancient manuscripts that still exist today. Despite the fact that many, many, many modern scholars claim that it is not found anywhere in old Greek manuscripts. Manuscript number 221 is the earliest Greek manuscript. Uh, it dates from the 10th century. There are approximately 500 Greek manuscripts that exist that have some part of First John on them. This number is important because some, some modern critics claim that First John 5, 7, and 8 cannot be found in any of the 5,000 plus, nearly 6,000 ancient manuscripts of the New Testament. So they intentionally, or in ignorance, mislead the people into believing that a huge number of manuscripts have 1 John, when in reality most of them don't have any manuscripts of 1 John, or 2 John, or 3 John, or many of the other various books that we have in the Bible today. This is a, Greek, a picture of the Greek of 1 John 5, 3 through 10, by the way. 1 John 5, 6 was also corrupted, not well known. It was corrupted in the early manuscripts, including the Codex Vaticanus, the Codex Sinaiticus, and the Codex Alexandrinus. As we see here in English, there's very little difference in the English today. But back in the first century, 1 John 5, 6 was corrupted in the Greek. You never, ever, ever, ever see this fact mentioned in the critics' materials. <clears throat> because they can't afford to delete too much material from their paraphrased Bibles, lest they lose more trust from the sheep than they've, than they've already lost. The critics like to say, thank you, sir. The critics like to say that all true biblical texts must be supported by very ancient Greek manuscripts and yet they themselves fail to follow their own rule. Another passage of several that is never mentioned by the critics is 1 John 2, 23b. The part in green here is left out of the Byzantine text, and yet it's in the Latin Vulgate. This means that it was not supported by the majority text. So they shouldn't like it, right? The critical tech, the critic, the critic shouldn't like it. And yet you'll find this passage in the ESV, the NIV, the NASB, etc. It's another example where the critics are inconsistent in their approach to analyzing manuscripts. They claim that the Byzantine is unreliable, corrupt, not worth looking at, and yet they pull from it for this particular part, from this particular text. There are other examples that I won't share with you because I don't have time, but this proves that everyone on the various sides 
of the arguments agree that the Latin is more reliable in some cases. It also proves that the critics are inconsistent in their approach. So argument number three. John preferred to use, to refer to Christ as the Word in some cases. We see that in his gospel account, and we see it as the word logos is translated into word from the Texas Receptus. It's totally consistent with John's style. <clears throat> if the critics had, uh, if it was a conflation or an add-on, as the, as the critics would claim, surely they would have used the word son rather than the word word to make their case to make the uh, case for the Trinity even more clear. I believe that the passage was not glossed because it was there from the beginning and early corruptions of the epistle ripped the comma out of the scripture instead of the other way around. Argument number three is also not the best evidence for keeping 1 John 5, 7, B to 8a in the scripture. Argument number four, contextual agreement requires it. Compare the first passage here in this slide, which is not good English. I won't read it to you because I'm going to run out of time. But the, I made up this first passage. It's not good English. I used the exact same words in the second passage, and it is good English. It makes sense. So if you mix up your words in English, they're not going to make sense. Sometimes you will not, people will not know what you're talking about. And that's what's going on with 1 John 5, 7, and 8. The grammar has to make sense, and when you take the comma out, 1 John 5, 7, 8, 8, 8, it doesn't make sense in Greek. Now, this is not the best argument for keeping this in the Scripture, but it's getting pretty close. <clears throat> now, here we've got the grammar Nazi. <clears throat> that's what that G is. Could it be true that God made a grammatical error? No, absolutely not. God doesn't make errors. Here we have the, the blue is uh, masculine. The green is neuter. In Greek, as in many other languages, many words are genderized. Masculine, feminine, neuter. And uh, not only that, in, in Greek, but the adjectives, the articles, and the participles not only have to agree in nouns, have to agree with each other in gender, but they also have to agree in a, a number and in uh, person. So it could be first person, second person, third person, singular or plural, for example. They have to, all this has to agree in Greek and most other languages. We don't really have masculine, feminine, and neuter in English, but as an example of bad grammar to kind of illustrate the point, uh, I might say, he gave birth to a to them healthy eight pound, two ounce baby. Now, if I said that, would you understand what I was talking about? You'd think I, I was crazy. Men don't give birth, much less them. It's a little bit more complicated in Greek or other languages, but it has been ascertained and verified by Greek scholars and by scholars who were born to Greek parents, hence Greek was their first language, that the Westcott Hort version of 1 John 5, 7, 8 simply does not make sense. The syntax is messed up. The grammar is foul. God doesn't make mistakes and is not the author of confusion. So it is simply wrong. So if we look at it in English, and we can see that the adjective three is masculinized, the, the uh, blue is masculine, the green is neuter, to match the participle. The second, the participle is translated either as testify or bear record or bear witness, and it's in the masculine form in verses 7 and 8. And because this is the masculinized English phrase that bear witness, it must refer to masculine nouns. Therefore, the phrase cannot refer to the spirit and the water and the blood in verse 8. It simply isn't possible. And yet that's what Westcott and Hort want us to believe. In other words, the spirit and the water and the blood are not, bear, not bearing witness on earth. <coughs> uh, instead, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost are bearing witness on earth 
to the spirit, the water, and the blood. That's the way it's supposed to be. Argument number five. All key sources for the alternative Bibles or alternative Bible were unregenerate. None of these men were saved. I demonstrated that fact about four of these men at last year's Dean Burgon meeting by using quotes from their own writings. And this also is not the best argument for keeping or retaining First John Top 7 Beat 8 day in the Scripture. Today, Bruce Metzger seems to be the go-to guy. He's one of these guys on this list. Uh, with regard to all of the common objections that permeate the seminaries and uh, churches around the world when it comes to uh, 1 John 5, 7, and 8. And I'm trying to get my computer to behave here. He has five main things to say about this, about this passage in question. Number one, he says the passage is absent from every known Greek manuscript except four. I've already shown that that's incorrect. Um, he says that it's not found in the Latin, and I've already shown that that's not correct. The old Latin. Secondly, he says the passage is quoted by none of the Greek fathers who, had they known it, most certainly would have employed it in the Trinitarian controversies. Its first appearance in Greek was the Greek version of the Acts of the Lateran Council in 1215. That's wrong, too. The passage is quoted by several Greek fathers, including Cyprian, Tertullian, Augustine. And furthermore, I marked this in blue here, but he says most certainly, most certainly is an opinion. Metzger has nothing to back up his claim in any of his writings. It's total conjecture. I could go on and list a whole bunch of examples, but I don't have time. Number three, the passage is absent from the manuscripts of all the ancient versions except the Latin. It's not found in the Old Latin in its early form. It is not found in the Vulgate as issued by Jerome. It's not in the revision by Alcuin. It's the, the earliest instance of the passage being quoted as a part of the actual text of 1 John is a 4th century Latin treatise, treatise entitled Liber Apologeticus attributed to either the Spanish heretic Priscillian or to his follower Bishop Instantius. Apparently the gloss arose when the original passage was understood to symbolize the Trinity, an interpretation which may have been written first as a marginal note and afterwards found its way into the text. Wrong. Again, Metzger likes to use the words all and except in the same sentence. It's a real common thing that he does. He aims to deceive by his enigmatic way of writing. So what is it, and also, what is he exactly does he mean by ancient versions? In the first and second century, there was no canonized Bible as we know it today. What does he mean by that? It certainly was present in the other languages of the day as they were translated into the various languages um, at the time, in the first and second centuries. Unfortunately, most of those documents were destroyed by fire due to Emperor Diocletian's edict. Also, many copies were simply worn out and then copied again and again and again for each subsequent generation up until the European invention of the printing press in the 15th century. The dominant of the language of the day was Latin, so one would expect to find it in Latin, and we find it in Latin, no surprise there. I've already shown that the passage was found in the Old Latin, in its early form, and in the Vulgate. So these are outright lies. Metzger also cites Priscillian as being a heretic. I don't know whether the guy was a heretic or not. It doesn't really matter. The fact is, he cited the quotation, and it's dated to that time. Furthermore, Metzger's heroes, Origen, Westcott, and Hort, were definitely heretics, but you'll never find that fact mentioned in any of Metzger's works. Lastly, Metzger makes free use of the words, apparently, may have, here, and in much of his work. I've read his book, The Text of the New Testament, and excerpts from some of his other books, and you find he just about wears out all these words like uh, suggest, seems to be. Should, could, doubtless. It makes it very, very difficult to pin down what this guy really believes as an absolute belief of his. He's a very shifty character. Uh, also common with Metzger was to have footnotes in his book 
referencing a source that did not support his claim or claims. It's real common. Another thing that he would do was have a cite a source that's in another language so that the reader couldn't check up on it unless they happen to know the other language. Number four, as regards transcriptional probability that Metzger says this, if the passage were original, no good reason can be found to account for its omission, either accidentally or intentionally, by copyists of hundreds of Greek manuscripts and by translators of ancient versions. Actually, there are several possible reasons that scribes might have left the passage out of John's first epistle. Unintentional reason might be a copyist error. Intentional reason could be uh, malicious intent or Sabellianism. Sabellianism was the belief that the three persons of the Trinity were not really three persons at all, but instead different modes of one God, in other words, three manifestations of one solitary God. <clears throat> Last one that Metzger says claims that supports keeping 1 John 5, 7, and 8 out is, uh, he says, as regards intrinsic, intrinsic probability, the passage makes an awkward break in the sense. And in his typical enigmatic fashion here, he tries to delude the reader toward his way, towards his way of thinking and uh, with a short statement. But the, the fact is, it doesn't make any sense if you leave the comma out. He got it backwards, which is pretty typical for him. Uh, so his final grade on these, he was a professor, so I had to grade him. His final grade on these, on these questions, these five questions, I get, he got a zero. Big fat F minus. Unfortunately, there are many, many, many seminary students and professors who influence people that are going into the pastorate and other professors that come out for many, many years. And they adore Metzger. They think that anything he wrote is impervious to error. And this is, goes back to what uh, Brother White was talking about with the influence. Argument number six, the historic church. There's good evidence that 1 John 5, 7b to 8a was included in the Bible used by the majority of the true believers for the last 1900 years. It was even used by the Roman Catholics over the years. Uh, <clears throat> it's been used, you can trace it back 1800 plus years, but up, up to around 1881, that's when Westcott and Hort published their, their uh, Greek New Testament text. This list here that I, that I listed uh, some of the groups that Thought that used the Textus Receptus, the way the, found in Acts 9, the Christians, the Donatists, the Waldensians, the Lollards. It's not meant so much to endorse every one of the Donatists, Waldensians, or Lollards, etc., whoever lived, but just like the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the various groups that exist today, they had problems with theological and doctrinal drift amongst some members in individual churches. However, these groups do have a record of having fought for the faith the best way that they knew how during their age. Today, the Maldensians are pretty much apostate, but they endured many, many years of persecution and death and stood firm for the true Bible for many centuries. They used the old Italic or the old Latin, and that's why the naysayers want to, would prefer that the old Latin be discredited. This argument, number six, is not the best argument for keeping 1 John 5, 7, 8, 8 in the Scriptures. Argument number seven. This is the best argument for including 1 John 5, 7, 8, 8 a in the Scriptures. The testification of Scripture itself. These passages, just a few, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The Scripture cannot be broken. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Knowing that all Scripture, not some of it, is given by the inspiration of God and that it is good for us, we must know which Scripture is profitable in order to produce good works. God's definition of good, not our definition of good, because our God does not lie. Okay, I don't have time to go into the miscellaneous counter-arguments. I'm going to skip them except for the last one. 
Number four. Number four. The comma, the critics will say that the comma Jehannam is not in or it is not acknowledged in the most reliable manuscripts, including the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus. Those are their precious documents because they don't have it. They don't think it belongs. This in itself is laughable, which we'll look at in just a second. What do we have here? And if you can see this, this is a scan of 1 John 5, 6 through 8 in Codex Vaticanus. Do you see the dots that are under the red arrow at verse 7? That's an umlaut. The dots are. What they represent is an acknowledgement by the scribe or his supervisor that other possible texts did exist for this passage. And since the comma is and was the only variant text ever known for this passage, that is what the umlaut represented. It's dated from the early 4th century. So that gives some pretty airtight proof that the comma was known about and was in use some during that time, contrary to what Bruce Metzger and other modernists would have us believe, that it didn't exist during that time. So what's so meaningful about this is that the Codex Vaticanus is truly the textual critic's most precious manuscript, although in reality it's a very very corrupt manuscript. <clears throat> so let's look at a few reasons not to trust the Codex Vaticanus or the Codex Sinaiticus. And this is just six reasons of many. First, 3,036, there are 3,036 textual variances or differences in the Gospels alone between the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus. They don't even agree between their most precious documents. Just in the Gospels, 3,000 differences. Over 14,000 corrections have been written into the margins of the Codex Sinaiticus. 14,000. Countless grammatical errors in Sinaiticus. Again, does God make mistakes? No. Vaticanus leaves out 1,491 words or phrases in the Gospels alone. Just leaves them out. Just in the Gospels. Vaticanus uses classical Greek and not Koine Greek. Vaticanus contains the Septuagint, a spurious Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Sinaiticus contains about half of the Septuagint. So after looking at these six reasons not to trust the Codex Vaticanus or the Codex Sinaiticus, it's really hard to understand how true baptized believers could fall for such obvious garbage that these two codices represent. But then again, when one understands that Satan is the master deceiver, one begins to see how good he is at what he does. Here's a comparison of 1 John 5, 6 through 8 between Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus. Note that in verse 6 of Vaticanus it says that Jesus Christ came by water and blood. And yet in the Sinaiticus it says that Jesus Christ came by water and blood and the Spirit. So even though these two manuscripts have an error, are in error having removed 1 John 5, 7, B to 8, A, they don't even agree between themselves in this passage that I've been talking about this afternoon. Jesus said, if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Sounds like somebody... And something is going to fall. <clears throat> so, in conclusion, 
This is the word in Greek, Texas Receptus, which you can't see, but, but it's in Greek for 1 John 5, 7 and 8, that was given to man by the inspiration of God. We should read it. We should study it. We should meditate upon it. We should act upon it, just like the rest of Scripture. Also, those of us who have studied this issue and other textual issues about the Bible have a responsibility to defend the truth and to answer others who have questions about the truth. Thank you. I did forget. Please turn to Psalm 119, verses 17 through 24, and stand for the reading of God's Word. Let's read together Psalm 119, beginning with verse 17. Deal bountifully with thy servant, that I may live and keep thy word. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath unto my, thy judgments at all times. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Please be seated. Thank you very much, Brother Shepherd. We're sorry that we can't see all the things up there because of the daylight. Uh, we have another message coming up also that is streamed, so it's from Dr. Ben. Let's open the Hymn number 415, 415, and sing one stanza, Be Still, My Soul. Stand, or no, keep remaining seated, that's fine. He's going to be speaking to us from Australia with a DVD, The Legacy of the King James Bible. While he's getting set up, just to have a few uh, questions. People have had half questions from all over the world. Simply write us questions at bftbc.org. Questions at bftbc.org. Another one from Wisconsin. Uh, Wendy Kosick uh, says she's listening, and she's so glad to be able to listen and watch. Thanks for the ladies' messages for Christine and Barbara. Looking forward to listening to all the men as well. Also, we heard from someone, uh, Dr. Bennett himself, David Bennett, who's going to be speaking to us. It's going on 6 a.m. this morning here in Australia. 
we're enjoying the messages of the 216 uh, DBS. Thank you for streaming these so we can enjoy hearing our King James Bible and its texts defended. May the Lord bless all of you there as we meet you these two days. So that's good from Australia. Another one from Bill Hendricker. Uh, he says, thank you kindly for the live streaming for the DBS conference. What a blessing. My question has to do with David Norton's 2005 edition of the King James Version of the New Cambridge Paragraph Bible. What, if any, should we be aware of regarding Norton's edition of the KJV? Uh, I believe we should stick with the defined King James Bible, which is the Cambridge edition. No need to soup it up and make it an up-to-date paragraph Bible. We've got what we need. I've checked some of these references, and they're the same as the ones we have, so keep it as we have it. One last one. This is from... Uh, from Dr. Ken Mato, a friend of ours from many years. Uh, he talks about uh, David Daniels, Chick Publications researcher, uh, David Avery, uh, proving that Sinaiticus is a 19th century forgery, counterfeit, and so on. So he appreciates that. He's enjoying the conference very much and encourages us to get that if we can. Pastor Dan, are we ready for Dr. David Bennett from Australia? Well, there's a title once again. Let me repeat the title, which is The Legacy of the King James Bible. And after that, our fellow will read the scripture, Brother Bunch from that. Today from Australia, and I'd like to start by thanking Dr. Spencer and his church for uh, providing their premises for this uh, DBS 2016 meeting. The book I want to introduce you to is uh, by Leyland Riken, and it's The Legacy of the King James Bible. It has 272 pages. Le Leyland Riken was born in Pella, Iowa in 1942, and uh, I was born in Burlington, Iowa, and then grew up in Ottumwa, which is just south of Pella, so I'm familiar with where he grew up. He attended Central College there in Pella, then he became uh, an English professor, a Bible professor at Wheaton College. He's now Professor Emeritus of English at Wheaton College there in Wheaton, Illinois. He was also the uh, literary stylist for the uh, English Standard Version Bible. And uh, he's also the author of How to Read the Bible as Literature and uh, Words of Delight. He's a literary introduction to the Bible as well as co-editor of Riken's Bible Handbook and the ESV Library Study Bible. He was a literary content contributor to the ESV Study Bible released in 2008. So you can see where his uh, own personal preference is as far as it comes to translations. He does explain through the book that he prefers those that are literal translations to dynamic. He has no use at all for the dynamic equivalency, such as the NIV, and that's explained in the book. Now, in the preface, uh, we find that there is a recommendation, and uh, one of those that recommends the book is Donald L. Brake. He's the Dean Emeritus at Multima Bi Biblical Seminary in Portland, Oregon. Now, Portland, or Multima, is not a fundamentalist school. It would be, I think, within the New Evangelical School. Uh, Bruce Wilkinson of J. Bez's Prayer is a former professor there at the school. And then they also have two well-known graduates. One is Lewis Plow, which is associated with the Billy Graham Crusades, so we've all heard of him. And Dan Kimball. Kimball was a principal voice in the United States in the early days of the emerging church movement. Now, Dr. Brake, uh, in his recommendation, said Riken's personal, and I'm quoting, personal acquaintance with the text of the KJV was from a very early age and gives his delightful stories for a ring of authenticity. Dr. Riken will lead you into a deep appreciation of this 400-year-old translation. The beauty of its language, its undeniable influence on American and English culture, and its molding of library, literary personalities, poets, musicians, and yes, even politicians. Once I began reading Riken's book, I couldn't put it down. 
will tempt you to go to your bookshelf, blow the dust off your KJV, and then begin reading it again. End of quote. And so, uh, even those that uh, hold to the King James uh, Bible, the superiority of its translation of principles and uh, its theology, and uh, it is based upon the correct manuscripts, uh, some need to dust it off and read it and see what it actually uh, has to say. Not only believe it, but we need to read it. So, uh, Dr. Riken uh, sees the ESV and the RSV and the uh, New American Standard in the line of the King James because they claim to be a word-for-word -word translation rather than a dynamic equivalent translation. He did say, if I were forced to choose between the King James Bible and a modern colloquial translation, I would choose the King James Version. Now, in part one, the King James Bible in its own day, well, we read this. In this section, we are taken back into the history before the making of the King James Bible. And part one is divided into four portions. One, in the beginning. Two, from Tyndale to the King James Bible. Three, the making of the King James Bible. And four, the King James Bible of 1611. And he starts off by discussing John Wycliffe. Now, I'm not going through all of this because, uh, well, you wouldn't have to read the book then. And I'm only taking 30 minutes. Wycliffe differed with the Roman Catholic Church in many ways, but one big difference was that he desired for the common man to have the scriptures in his own words. Uh, in his own hands so he could read it, whereas the Roman Catholic Church sought to keep the average man from possessing the Bible. That's not so much today, but uh, they cannot interpret it. Only the church can do the interpretation. Wycliffe knew, and quote, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This difference led to Wycliffe being hated and persecuted by the Church of Rome. Riken asks, in what way is Wycliffe to be considered the definitive originator of the King James Bible? And he gives three reasons to answer that question. The first is this. Wycliffe had the vision for the Bible to be in the English language. He writes that, and I quote, Wycliffe and his associates had that vision and proved that the vision could be put into practice. Secondly, the impetus between, behind the translation of the Bible into English is twofold, spiritual and evangelical. The goal of Bible translation is for the lay people to understand the Bible in their language and obey it through the living of their lives. Thirdly, the Wycliffe translators eventually evolved the principle that the language and syntax of an English translation must be clear and understandable to an English reader. It is Riken's contention that Wycliffe was important, but it was William Tyndale who deserves the highest homage as the found, fountainhead of English Bible translation. Tyndale shares something important with Wycliffe and the Lollards that he does not share with the King James translators. He translated the Bible under the threat of his life. Martyrdom was, as we know, to be Tyndale's end due to his translation work of the English Bible. What was Tyndale's goal? Ryken says it was the same as Wycliffe's, which was to see the Bible infiltrate the whole cross-section of his country. A love for his country and his people. He wanted them to have the Word of God. Now, from Tyndale to the King James Bible, in this chapter... Riken sketches uh, for us, the reader, the major English Bible translations between Tyndale and the KJV, with emphasis on what these translations contributed to the King James Bible. He now asks three questions, and they are, uh, the preface to the King James Version makes it clear that the translation had endeavored to produce the best possible translation for many good ones. What are these good translations? They became woven into the KJV. And what were their specific contributions? Secondly, Tyndale lived in hiding and was murdered for translating the Bible, whereas the King James translators were an honored group as they translated the scriptures. What forces arrived on the scenes that uh, scene that made explain such a drastic turnaround? 
And thirdly, the King James Bible is an anomaly in carrying the name of a British monarch. Is there something in the history of English Bible translation that might account for this situation? It was from 1535 to 1611. The world was introduced to Coverdale's Bible, Matthew's Bible, the Great Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Bishop's Bible, and then the King James Bible. Then we go on to this chapter of the making of the King James Bible. And it seeks to answer five questions. One, who came up with the idea for the King James Bible? Well, he answers that in a long section, but uh, the simple answer to the first question he wrote is the Puritans and the king himself. The second question was, who did the translation? And uh, his answer is by saying the king, and I quote, had approved 54 men to work on the translation, but surviving lists indicate that 47 scholars actually did the work. These were There were six committees meeting at three different locations. There were two each at Westminster Abbey in London and the University of Oxford and Cambridge. It can be said in a spirit of fair-mindedness all sides of the Church of England were represented. From Puritans to extreme high churchmen to various grades between those poles, approximately a fourth of the group were Puritans in their convictions. End of quote. Third question was, what was the process of translation like? And he handles that. And fourthly, what were the circumstances of the first appearance of the King James Version as a printed book? And the fifth question, what was the early history of the book's reception? And Riken spends the rest of that chapter answering verses 3, 4, and 5. The next chapter is the King James Bible of 1611. And in this chapter, Dr. Riken is answering the question, what about the actual Bible that was first published in 1611? How was the King James Bible different from its predecessors? And uh, he gives us three things. The first is that the King James Bible is an amalgamation, I'll get that out, amalgamation of the English translations that had preceded it in the 16th century beginning with Tyndale, then Coverdale, Matthew's Bible, the Great Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Bishop Bible. In this amalgamation, the King James Bible refined those earlier translations. Secondly, the King James has a flow which is matchless. That's in quotes, matchless. This flow continues unsurpassed to this day. Unsurpassed. The translators of the King James Bible were, quote, consciously seeking Rhythmetic excellence, end of quote. Thirdly, the King James was a Bible translated preeminently for public use. That's in quotation marks, preeminently for public use. And as shown, quote, its versatility by being ideally suited for oral use in public settings, end of quote. The use of the King James for public reading is varied from being read or quoted in church services by politicians and by lawyers in the courtroom. Now, Riken concludes this chapter, the King James Bible of 1611, by saying, and I quote, Whether or not the King James is an accurate version depends partly on how we define accuracy. If we believe that the standard of accuracy is a translation giving us the words of the original text in equivalent English words, then the KJV shows its superior accuracy over modern dynamic equivalent translations on virtually every page of the Bible, and probably multiple times on every page. End of quote. Part 2, the King James Bible and History, the influence of the King James Bible on the history of Bible translation. Here Dr. Riken states his purpose, and that is to, and I quote, Trace the influence of the King James Version on Bible translation uh, for the past three centuries. End of quote. During those 300 years, the King James was the Bible. When you spoke of the Bible, it was the King James Bible. And, uh, the, and I'm quoting now, this is seen most dramatically when the Revised Version's New Testament hit the streets of London in 1881. 
there was an attempt to dethrone the King James Bible. And he goes on and says, The streets around the publishing house were blocked from dawn to dusk with processions of wagons being loaded with Bibles for transport. Leading newspapers in the United States had this, the text telegraphed for a serial printing. And the two, new translation sold 300,000 copies the first day it was available in New York City. But after the dust had settled, the KJV did not have its supremacy undermined at all. End of quote. Dr. Riken does not see the dynamic equivalency as a valid process of translating, as you'll find out and have already heard. He holds to an essentially literal process of translating the Bible. And I quote, The King James translators were so scrupulous about the words that they italicized words in their translation that were needed for the English sense but that were not present in the original text. The goal was obviously to avoid confusing the reader and contrariwise to keep the reader fully informed. I cannot avoid contrasting that procedure to dynamic equivalence translation, where the effort is to keep readers clueless, <laughs> clueless as to what the original says and uninformed regarding where the words of scripture and and the commentary uh, of the translators begins. End of quote. The influence of the King James Bible on culture. The King James, of course, has had a great influence on the culture in which we live via the courts, political discourses, public inscriptions, music, and the visual arts. Uh, Riken gives examples, and I'll just give this one of the courtroom. And uh, it says, I will, uh, in the courtroom, Riken says, and I quote, there is a link between the courtroom and the King James Version during the centuries of its ascendancy. He gives the book Classics of the Bar as an example. And quote here is a sampling. Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. Proverbs 11.21 This was Benjamin Tracy, conclusion in the Tilton v. Beecher, 1875. That's just one example, and then he gives uh, uh, Handel's Messiah in music, and he gives other examples. In part three, the King James Bible is a literary masterpiece. What makes an English Bible literary? He says, the King James Bible, and I quote, is the gold standard. This is a man that follows the ESV and been very prominent in that production of the ESV. He says the King James Bible is the gold, and I'm quoting, the gold standard for a literary Bible. End of quote. The basis for saying this is the gold standard is based on three factors, and I have these listed. One, there is, and I quote, the committee structure that produced the King James Bible. He uses that and he explains what he means by that. Two, it must be noted that, quote, the King James translators were not literary scholars. They were mainly experts in the ancient Hebrew and Greek languages in which the Bible is written. If by an act of imagination we transport them into our own situation, they would most likely be seminary professors teaching Hebrew and Greek with spatial attention to the Bible. End of quote. Thirdly, and I quote, the translators did not think of themselves as producing a literary Bible. Their primary aim was to produce an accurate translation of the original Bible. C.D. Maccabee notes that it was never in their minds that they were making a world literature. For the translators, the Bible is a book of religious significance from first to last. Alistair McGrath, which uh, some of you, many of you have read, similarly claims that the king's translators achieved literary merit unintentionally by focusing on what to, to them was a greater goal. The achievement of pro, prosaic and poetic elegance that resulted was, so to speak, a most happy accident of history. Well, I don't think it was an accident. Pro style in the King James Bible. On this, he says, the, and I quote, the prose of the King James Bible is one of its greatest triumphs. The foundation of the vocabulary is simple, and concrete, enriched with exalted words and rhetoric as the original text of the Bible required. 
certain stylistic traits like an abundance of and. Coordinates make the KJV distinctive and memorable. The crowning touch on this pro style is its rhythmic excellence. And I noticed when they use the and, uh, especially in the Old Testament, you'll notice that. I'll jump on to part four, uh, the literary influence of the King James Bible. Uh, here, Dr. Riken states that there is a role for the reader and that, quote, unless a reader makes the identification and engages in analysis of the re relevance of the reference, no biblical presence emerges. Um, now, I didn't find some chapters as interesting as others. And this matter of uh, looking forward to trying to find what the author, you know, picks some little piece uh, that uh, may have a reference. He does mention Bunyan in one of his chapters, which was very important, early literature, literary influence of the King James Bible. And uh, I will read from that. Riken discusses many writers from the 15, 16, and 1700s. One writer of note is John Bunyan. He writes, and I quote, beginning at the end of the 17th century and lasting for two centuries, the King James Bible and Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress were the two best sellers in evangelical Protestant households. As you move away from the 1700s and the 1800s, 1900s, and especially now, uh, you have to dig pretty deep to get any references or think of this. This reminds me of a missionary here in Australia that has uh, a, they rent a movie theater and they watch uh, secular movies. Then they sit around discussing the trying to find what uh, might be something to to the Christian faith and so on and so forth. Well, with Bunyan, you didn't need to do that. It was throughout the whole thing. Now, I'm still quoting Charles Spurgeon said, Read anything of Bunyan and you will see that it is almost like reading the Bible itself. He had studied our authorized version, which will never be bettered, as I judge, till Christ shall come. He had read it till his whole being was saturated with Scripture. Prick him anywhere, and the very essence of the Bible flows from him. He cannot speak without quoting a text, for his soul is full of the Word of God. What a testimony of a man that loved God and loved his Word. And it says that... Uh, it was Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress that helped to form a love for the language of the KJB, the King James Bible itself. End of quote. Now I just want to uh, go to the afterword, but in between I do have uh, on a little bit on the modern air. Riken says of the authors of this time that, uh, and I quote, even though the Bible no longer elicits the religious belief of most authors, the King James Bible has remained a pervasive uh, literary uh, presence, end of quote. Now, this is the afterword, and uh, here he gives three points regarding how we should regard the King James Bible, and I think these are very uh, pertinent. The first point is celebrating a victory, and this includes, one, the King James's literary excellence. Two, the King James's relatively quick acceptance as the best English translation of the Bible. Three, the predominant use of the King James Bible by English-speaking Christians for over 300 years. And uh, in surveys, the King James Bible comes out sometimes third, sometimes fourth. But it's near the top of the list. It's still after 400 years, the King James Bible is being read by a multitude of millions and millions of people in spite of what others say of archaic language and so on. The Thirdly, the predominant use of the King James Bible by English-speaking Christians for over 300 years. I read that one. Four, the King James Bible status is virtually the sole biblical influence on American and British cultures to the present day. The second point is lamenting a loss. Here he says, one, Christendom lost a common Bible. When you used to say of the Bible, I, I quote from the Bible, they knew you were quoting from the King James Bible. Now you quote from the Bible, you got to put down KJV or NIV or whatever. 
the way it sounds often tells you that it's not the King James, but now you don't know. We don't have a common Bible. Two, Christendom lost the authority of the Bible. When you lose the Bible, you lose its authority. Christendom, thirdly, lost biblical literacy. People don't know the Bible as they did. John Bunyan, a shoemaker, uh, he knew his Bible. And I was able to download Pilgrim's Progress being read in a dramatic sort of way. I played it on the radio. Beautiful. The Bible straight through. He knew what he was talking about. Fourthly, Christendom lost the the effective and literary power of the King James Bible. The third point uh, he gave us is holding on to what is excellent. One, the King James Bible after 400 years and a multitude of new translations still holds second or third place on sales list. And uh, the top ten best-selling translations, this is from uh, rosepublishing.com. First was the NIV, second the voice, third King James. Fourth was the English Standard Version uh, and on down. But the King James was in third place. Uh, under this uh, holding on to what is excellent the second point is the King James Bible is translated on the proper translation principles thirdly uh, when the King James Bible is used by poets, writers and others we too should use the same Uh, Riken says and I quote there is no excuse for perpetuating the naive practice of speaking of the Bible in connection with the work of these artists and then quoting from whatever translation we ourselves use. You know, that's what some preachers use. Uh, They pick out, they know what a text, but they want to fit what they want to say, so they pick out uh, the NIV or the message or one of these versions to fit in. Uh, You know, a well-known preacher out on the West Coast does that. But uh, that's not what we should do. We should use the King James Bible, that which God has given to us. So my conclusion is this. Now, you can download this in PDF, and it's free. So it's it's a bargain. You can read this and use it. That's what I did. I downloaded it in PDF. In spite of Dr. Riken's acceptance of the ESV, this book is worth reading, especially since you can get it in PDF for nothing. Some chapters are more interesting than others, but which ones uh, depend on the reader. That's what I found. A search of the Internet will lead you to a downloadable PDF, which costs nothing. So the only cost is your time, which is valuable. But it only costs you your time in which it takes for you to read the book. And I believe that it will be well worth your time. Thank you for uh, your time that uh, I could be with you. I wish I could be there with you, enjoying each message, but I'll enjoy it on the Internet. Thank you, Dr. Waite and Dan, for putting it on the Internet so the rest of us can enjoy it. Thank you. I love you men, and I trust that God will bless your time together. Goodbye now. Oh, scripture reading. Uh, keep standing. Scripture reading first. I'm sorry. Scripture reading first. Go right ahead. Pardon me. We're reading Psalm 119, starting at verse 25. My soul cleaveth unto the dust. Quicken thou me according to thy word. I have declared my ways, and thou hearest me. Teach me thy statutes. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. So shall I talk of thy wondrous works. My soul melteth for heaviness. Strengthen thou me according unto thy word. 
Remove from me the way of lying, and grant me thy law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. I have stuck unto thy testimonies, O Lord. Put me not to shame. I will run the way of thy commandments, when thou shalt enlarge my heart. Thank you very much. You may be seated. You may be seated. Let's turn then, please, to hymn number 416, Grace Greater Than Our Sins. Fifteen minutes. We'll go to supper right here, over to the other place, the other uh, building, and uh, that's it from five o'clock. And we hope we'll be back here about quarter of seven, so we can begin our promptly at our evening service. We have two more speakers this evening, and uh, we have time for a few questions and answers as well. We heard a question from John Fogarty Jr., uh, and he said, "If God supposedly preserved the word throughout all ages." Why was the Johannine comma not preserved among the vast body of Greek manuscripts, not just Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, throughout all their copying history, as is the case with the preservation of other readings among the vast majority of all Greek manuscripts? My question, John, would be this. Simply write us for a PDF free copy of Dr. Jack Mormon's analysis of 1 John 5, 7, and 8. In that analysis, he points out very clearly that seven or eight or nine early church fathers quoted the whole First John 5, 7, and 8. If they quoted it, where did they get it? It was there in the originals. And the question is, why is it eliminated from the vast majority? The answer was found in one of the books we read many years ago. The man in the 300s A.D., who was the head of the Greek Orthodox Church, did not believe in the Trinity. He was a Unitarian. And it's supposed, that we don't have any proof of this, but it's supposed, it could be right. He said, tear out the part of verse 7, the part of verse 8, that's Trinity. Because I don't believe in Trinity. Knock it out. So that's the why, if that be true. That's the historical ref record. People have quoted that. The third thing about it is this. As was pointed out by Brother Shepherd very clearly, if you leave in all parts of verse 7, verse 8 of 1 John 5, 7, the genders coalesce. Feminines with feminines, neuters with neuters. You take out those words that were removed to have the Trinity, you have feminines and neuters, feminines and neuters, completely contrary to Greek grammar. So, John Fogarty, I request you to write us, BibleForToday.org, and simply ask for a copy of Dr. Jack Mormon's very excellent 15-page analysis. I'll send it to you free and postpaid PDF. Anybody here in the room, you want it to, just send it to me. I'll be glad to give it to you. All right. Uh, now, we have a few minutes, in fact, ten minutes, and we don't want to waste a minute. Maybe you have some other comments on that. Brother Shepard, do you want to say anything more about that question or any other question? All right. Anybody else have any comments or questions? We have ten minutes of questions and answers. Who's got a question? Glad to have Dr. Boyce with us. He's here. Came a little later for, for travel and so on. We're glad to have him here with us. He'll be with us the rest of the time. Any questions you might have? My question is what are we going to do tonight from 7.55 to 8.15 on questions and answers? 
you have no questions now, you're going to have any time at 7 o'clock? Just think of it. Scratch your head a little bit. I'll wait about one more minute for more questions that you might have. Pastor Dan's got one? Okay. Pastor Dan said, those that are watching online, please give us your name and your state, where you're from, and who are watching through our Internet, a streaming of our Dean Burgan Society meeting. All right. Uh, hearing nothing? Well, there boys, would you stand and lead us in a word of, bender, of, of prayer before we go over for supper tonight, if you would, please, sir. Amen.